Our favorite guy is uh, High Pitch Eric. Favorite whack pack? Yeah, favorite. High Pitch Eric versus Speech Impediment Man. And these guys call Speech Impediment Man speech. They've abbreviated hey, by... speech. Speech impediment man and have him on the air. And their innovation is to call me speak. This fight, man, it's just it's insane. Medicated Pete has his own show on the gods. Oh, no, that's incredible. They built some sort of business. And I real quick before I go, uh, can I can I plug my show on the gods of Bonds network? No. no. <laughs> why, why should I plug that? Would you be so kind as let me promote my new show? Uh, Ed, real... we're in the middle of a no, breaking please. news story. All on the Gonzo Network. The big network. Yeah. These guys have to develop the whole network on the... What, the Whack Pack? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, good for them. Welcome back this week to the Balls from Elwood Show, folks. We have a very special show this week. I have a very special guest this week. My guest is the one, the only, you know him, you love him, Speech Impediment Man. Speech, would you like to say hi to the audience? How you doing, audience? I hope you all tune in to, uh, to this show because it's a great one because we had a great time at Horror Hound in Indiana. Speech, would you like to tell the audience a little bit about who did you get to run into? I'm sure you've seen a lot of weirdos like we did, but uh, who was probably who was the coolest person you met uh, the, today at the horror hunt? Uh, probably Kiefer Sutherland. He, uh, I talked to him a little. He turns out he's a big Howard fan, and he's uh, working on a music career. Oh, wow. That's cool. What kind of music is he doing? He's doing country music. Um, I ran into Billy Zane. He was a cool cat. Uh, in fact, you have a strange story about Billy you might want to share with the audience. <laughs> I tell you what, man. I, I love Billy Zane. I got a kick out of him. I was a fan of Billy Zane from the movie Demon Knight. I watched it with my family uh, a few weeks ago because I shared it with them. I really love that flick. But it's funny. I really wanted to meet Billy Zane, so... Uh, we had went for a few hours speech, uh, Xtina, uh, my stepdaughter and I, we went last night uh, for a couple hours before close. So uh, we had seen Billy Zane, you know, he's sitting there, he's in his uh, neckerchief, uh, he's just, you know, he's eating. I didn't want to interrupt the dude because I think it's very uh, rude to interrupt somebody when they're eating, you know. He, uh, if I was a real celebrity, I, you know, I would want people not to bother me when I was eating, I guess. Uh, actually, I wouldn't give a shit. I would probably just still say hi to you anyway, but... But anyway, we approached him. He was actually really, really cool. He, uh, you know, I thought he would be cool. I think he's cool with that movie. But uh, yeah, Xtina had her reservation. She actually thought he'd be kind of a douche. But uh, you know, he even surprised her. So I come up to him and uh, I tell him, I go, uh, "Hey, man, I really like you in Demon Knight." And uh, he was like, "Oh, thank you so much," you know. And I'm like, uh, "I gotta ask you though." You know, all that ho hooping and hollering and all that uh, stuff with that character, uh, you know, could you, uh, uh, was that all impromptu? Like, did you just make that shit up on the fly? And, uh, oh, then, then, it, then, it, then it starts, man. That's whenever, uh, speech, how did you put it? <laughs> he said, oh, my God, I had to improv. The whole script was total shit. I had to put my special Billy Zane on there. <laughs> and I looked at him and I go, are 
did you rehearse this bullshit or what? I thought it was really funny. It was it was pretty good, man. He's like, uh, you know, first of all, if I'm not mistaken, I think Robert Zemeckis had something to do with that uh, in the script even. I mean, he's wrote some of the best scripts of our time. And the dude's like, you should have read this script. When I read it, it was so dull. I had to bring, I had to bring this, I had to bring my own life and my own Billy Zane touch to this script. And this character was nothing. This character was shit until I put my own special touch on it. So I'm really glad you liked my work. <laughs> and I mean, that this, he could have went on for probably five, six hours about, you know, how much he, he really made this movie. So he was, he was very, very proud of Demonite Cat. So I'm, uh. You know, in case you guys were wondering, uh, you, you need to wonder no, no, no further. So, other than that, I mean, speech. Did you meet anybody else? It was cool. Like, well, I, I don't even I'm not even sure who else you met. How was uh? I know you're meeting the Wednesday Adams chick from the Adams family. How was she? Was she? Yeah, great? I got a picture with her. She was a, a cool chick. I liked her. Um, I also ran into Martin Cohn, who was the Evo Sente sweep the leg in a Karate Kid. Turns out he's a good guy. Um, I talked to uh, Billy Vane's sister, Lisa Vane. Vane, she's a nice chick. <laughs> you know, uh, hey, how was uh, how was the chick from the Adams family looking? Is she uh, pretty beat up? Would you would you do her? I would do her, but uh, she's probably a little haggard. But mm. you know me. I mean, I don't have too much criteria. I just. <laughs> so, so on, on, on that being said, uh, the whole purpose we had went was uh, we had actually went to see when I was a kid. I met Robert England uh, probably when I was, I would say, I don't know, probably 10, 11 years old, maybe earlier. My grandpa had taken me to the shitty little video store that was up the street from where I lived at. And I never forgot it. When I was a kid, I met him. I went up there. He was really one of the nicest dudes to me ever. Uh, he gave me a little promotional thing from Nightmare on Elm Street 2. I'll never forget it. I wish I still had it. On one side, it was him. And on the other side, it was him after the extensive makeup, uh, you know, to turn into Freddy Krueger, which I always thought was really cool. So, you know, I hung out in my room as a kid. I always thought that was really neat. And then uh, I would I grew up, and then, uh, you know, I, I wanted that opportunity for my stepdaughter because she's super into Nightmare on Elm Street. So I thought that was a really cool thing we shared. And I have to say, he couldn't have been cooler he was as cool as i met him like how many years ago and he was really cool now i mean uh super nice guy i could you know i couldn't tell you how much better it could possibly be what else uh who else did you end up seeing speech uh i saw you were getting oh the ultimate bruce campbell tell them about that story that was great x tina you want to you want to talk about uh, how, how cool bruce was or? well sure um, he's pretty cool. I mean, he's just a hoot. He, he loves to talk. We went to the panel uh, Friday night and listened to him, you know, tease his former uh, co-stars on Evil Dead 2. Who was there? About how lame they were. Cassie DePaiva. And, who was Bobby Joe on uh, Evil Dead 2, folks. And who was also um, Blair Kramer on One Life to Live, and she plays Eve currently on Days of Our Lives. So she's known as this soap opera star, but... Apparently she's pretty big in the um, in the Evil Dead land as well. And then what's that other dude's name? Danny Hicks was there. Danny Hicks, yeah. Who he was he the big dumb redneck in Evil Dead too. The uh, carries the the luggage. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, Bruce was giving them a hard time and making all kind of cracks, and it was pretty amusing. And uh, you know, just telling crazy stories about what a crazy director Sam Raimi is, and all the crazy stuff he puts them through. And it was pretty interesting. It was very amusing. And um, what else? Would you uh, like to give him an account as to me waiting in line up to Bruce Campbell? Uh, sure, I'd love to. I don't know if I was allowed to talk You're about it. You're allowed to talk oh, about boy. it. Oh, boy. So, yeah, this is like Balls is like super duper hero idol. And we're waiting in line and we're like, I don't know, probably five minutes from meeting him. And he's literally, his eyes are welling up. I'm like, oh my God, you're having a Michael Jackson moment. It's going to be Beatlemania up in here, meeting Bruce Campbell for balls. He's going to ball like a baby. And uh, luckily, he kept it together, guys. He did tell Bruce, oh, I'm such a fan. I've been a fan of yours for such a long time. And, and Bruce is like, I'm sorry, man. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were like, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's really great, guys. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> 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 
But he wasn't like a dick. He was just being funny. But like they have to move those lines so freaking fast because there's just so many people trying to get through, and you know everybody wants their chance and wants to get their their fancy photo taken. And Riley got to meet uh, Freddie. Riley, you want to tell him about that? She goes up to him wearing a Chucky shirt, and what do he say to you, Riley? He said, that's Chucky, now i got to kill you. <laughs> Did you enjoy your time at Horror Hound? Yeah, it um, was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. This is my stepdaughter, guys, uh, out there in uh, Balls from Elwood Land. Uh, what was your favorite part of Horror Hound, kiddo? Um, I don't know. Hmm. Um... I could tell you my least favorite part, standing around waiting in lines. Oh, amen. I'm sure Speech would say the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yes, that wasn't good, but waiting in line for the Ghostbuster chick was well worth it. <laughs> see, well, I have no, I didn't see the Ghostbuster chick, so what the, you know, what was some of your favorite parts? What did you like doing? Um, my favorite part is when I got my Tiffany doll. Tiffany? Who's that? Tiffany from Bride of Chucky. Oh yeah, that's yep. pretty cool. Who, who did you like meeting? Who was your probably your favorite person you met? Um, I don't know. I really liked all of them. Well, that's cool. <laughs> so all around, uh, you know, we had a great time, folks. Uh, trying to think. Oh, I actually ran into Judge Reinhold. That was actually interesting. Uh, Judge Reinhold, uh, super nice guy. Very cool dude. Not, uh, you know, not looking so good. Had a lot of work done. Uh, looking pretty pulled back. Uh, I barely rec. He looks like a Mickey Rourke at this point, which is kind of disturbing. But uh, he was pretty funny. He actually, I got a, took a picture of him to uh, mess with Bruce because I guess him and Bruce are good friends. So I have to tweet that out, and I, I can't wait to see what uh, kind of Twitter war that's going to start. So other than that, what you got there, kiddo? You got your Tiffany doll? Yeah. She talk? Yep. Yeah. Let's see what she got to say here. Where are they, buddy? Where are you, Chucky? See, now that's the work of a true homicidal genius. <laughs> now that's all right, man. <laughs> Pretty cool, kid. Pretty cool. Oh, and I also I got to run into, I think, uh, as Beach said, he got to talk to Martin Cove, which was the uh, evil sensei from the Karate Kid. I got to rap with uh, William Zabka and him, and uh, I tell you what, uh, super cool news, uh, Cobra Kai Season 2 is filming next month. I was, as you know, if you listen to the show, I was a super humongous fan of that, and it's going to be back uh, pretty soon, so it's starting to film Season 2 next month, cats. That's some inside information that nobody knows yet that I can share with you guys. So, uh, hey, Speech, what else you got to say? What else happened? Uh, I see, we got split up a lot of the time, which kind of sucked because I wanted to spend some time with this dude here but uh it's so crazy there we had uh oh he had times i had times but uh so what else happened what uh else happened? everyone's dressed up in crazy costume that's taking pictures here and there i mean i uh, and you could buy a like mask of like uh your favorite characters dracula the mummy anyone I mean, it was just a great time here at Horror Hound. Um, in fact, I would like to come back here sometime. Uh, maybe we could have a special one, maybe just Gonzo Podcast. <laughs> Not so crowded. Speaking of Gonzo Podcast, that was cool too, man. We actually got to uh, speech X Tina, I, his family, and my family. Uh, we all got to hang out uh with uh, Jeff and his family tonight from GPN, and that was a good time. We had a nice little dinner after Warhound. It was a nice all-around day. I mean, uh, I will tell you in closing, uh, one of the things I love the most about these types of conventions, and this one in particular, you can be the biggest freak in the world. You can look as freaky as you want. You could be the looniest in the entire world, and they... We all come together, man. Like, uh, horror movie people get a bad rap. I love this kind of thing because we all come together. We're all cool with each other, and everybody's nice. And uh, we might look like a bunch of big circus freaks, but uh, actually we're all a bunch of cool people. And everybody, you know, we could come here and you could be whatever you want to be. You don't have to worry about judgment. I mean, we're going to look at you and make fun of you, of course, but that goes without saying. But uh, everybody's generally cool, and everybody is there for the same reason. And it's just a really cool feeling, cat. So if you get a chance to ever go to one of these, I highly recommend it. Speech, what do you think? If I could add one thing, uh, one of the 
reason I think the horror people uh, gravitate to these things is, I mean, we are not, we don't take this serious. I mean, we can laugh at ourselves. I mean, some of the stories Bruce was telling about, you know, you cut off a guy's arm and uh, five minutes later you could hear a pump pumping the blood out. I mean, <laughs> it's just funny things like that. And I mean, that's what I think made Evil Dead, maybe uh, Dark Shadows great, is the absurdity. I mean, the moment's supposed to be serious, but it's so funny. At the absurdity, you got to laugh. I, I agree, especially in the later sequels, things did get... Uh... Kind of, they coined actually those movies coined the term splat stick, where they kind of combine comedy and uh, you know gore. So I mean, uh, I couldn't agree more, Speech. I think that's a good point. But uh, yeah, just an all-around good time. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it's something uh, we look forward to. Where uh, where you know, Speech and I and uh, XT, even XT, you know, she likes to think she isn't, but she, uh, I think she is. My whole family is in the into the horror genre pretty heavily, so. You know, I highly recommend coming out here if you have a chance. Kind of makes me look forward to Halloween. Ooh. Ooh, I'll be looking forward to that too, Speech. So I'm thinking we might have to go to some haunted houses here. So, but yeah, that's our uh, that's our on the spot. Uh, you know, uh, review of horror hound. Uh, other than that, cats, I couldn't say I can't recommend it more. You need to get out, and if it comes to your town, you need to get out there and get your ass there. So, other than that, Speech, uh, you got anything else to say? Nope. Peace out from Andy Naples. Peace out, everybody. Peace out. Hey. hey, now, cats, we're back again this week with the Balls from Elwood show, and I have what I consider to be two of the funniest motherfuckers on the planet. Would you like to say hi to Roger Black and uh, in Waco? Uh, would you guys like to say hi to the audience? Hey, how you guys doing out there? And they're there. Hello, they're, audience. Yeah, they're here this week to. Uh, to tell you motherfuckers about something very special. They have a new show coming out on Netflix. It is called Paradise PD, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But I wanted to ask you guys, starting out, uh, yeah, I've been a fan of you cats for, it seems like forever, and I wanted to kind of, I know I know about you guys, but I'd like my audience to, because uh, I want you to, I want them to check all your shit out, because I think you're very, very talented. But I'd like to go back, uh, can you tell me a little bit about both you guys' formative years? Like, where did you guys grow up? And, like, uh, you know, what was you cats interested in when you were, you know, when you were kids? Were you always funny like this? Uh, I, I just had to be funny to keep my ass from getting kicked, basically. Because I'm 5'7 I'm now, and I was, like, two feet tall growing up. So, uh, and I'm from a, a really shitty uh, small town with nothing in it called Lakeland, Georgia. Yeah, Waco's from uh, South Georgia, and I'm from North Georgia. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was always the class clown, quote unquote. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was to definitely avoid getting my ass kicked as well. We have that in common. <laughs> uh, I have that in common as well. <laughs> I can, I can tell you all kinds of stories. <laughs> it actually works. What the? Yeah, I, 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 I can't, you know, strike a punch if, he, if he's, if he's laughing. So <laughs> we, uh, we, we use that to our advantage. Hey, what was you guys' relationship like with your parents growing up? I mean, did they encourage your aspirations? Uh, fuck no. Uh, they're all very Christian. Yeah. But, uh, he was Southern, uh, Waco was Southern Baptist, and I was Pentecostal. So, yeah, it was like uh, right next to uh, snake handling in a tent as far as my parents' religion went. But, uh, yeah, th uh, my dad, um, he's a, a, a Southern gentleman, and uh, he still doesn't know that I'm working in cartoons. He asked me the movie's going to be done to this day. <laughs> <laughs> you should just make a movie for him, like, one day and be like, here it is, dude. Yeah, yeah, well, he was, uh, I tell him, you know, we're trying to come up with ideas, you know, in between shows and stuff. He's like, won't you do a Western? <laughs> 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 what, uh, what did your folks do for a living? Uh, my dad was in textiles. And uh, I think because Dad was in rehab. But no. Yeah, yeah, most of my life. Yeah, he just drank. That was his job. <laughs> and ran around. And uh, my mom was a school teacher. 
Let, let me ask you guys, you guys have been involved in tons of projects. Just me thinking back, just off the top of my head, I remember watching The Damn Show. I remember watching, I mean, uh, obviously Rogers on, uh, you know, was Yucko on Stern. I mean, uh, you had Brickleberry, you have this new show coming out, you, uh, you're involved in all kinds of things. It, what uh, you know, what project do you guys think you're the most proud of? Uh, I think uh, Paradise PD, August 31st. <laughs> the new, the one that's paying the bills currently. <laughs> that's a good. Answer. I mean, they're you know they're all different. You know, I mean, we did we did damn show for so many years, and that's got such a you know so bittersweet that show because you know that was the one that we got rejected on more than any. You know, I mean, we started in '98 and we ended up getting a show on MTV Two in 2005. So that's how long that took. And uh, then Brickleberry, you know, it took a while. It started out live action and it ended up being a cartoon. But Paradise is definitely the show that, that took the least amount of time to go from concept to actually being on. It only took about six months, which is insanely fast for, for a show to go from concept to actually, you know, getting picked up as a series. I, do you do you, whenever you guys are writing like for like uh, I mean is is voice actors a lot easier to get along with than like like real actors I mean uh, how do, how do you whenever you're writing these characters do you have people in mind you're thinking of or I mean do you just how is how's that process go do you just bring people in and you just whoever works or I mean uh, can you explain a little bit about that Yeah you know, with Paradise we definitely since we knew a lot of voice actors we had voices in our heads uh, for this show for Brickleberry we didn't so much you know, we would just kind of do Woody's voice as just this gravelly, you know, angry man. We just knew he was going to be gravelly and angry, and that's about it. And Malloy was the hardest to get uh, down, because at first we were like, let's make him Scottish. And he actually was in our pilot. He had a Scottish accent, and it was really weird and didn't work at all. And then uh, for a period of time, we are like, let's make him sound like a little, you know, high-pitched, cute little animal and we weren't digging that either so it wasn't until you know it was a pilot for fox and then fox passed they didn't want to put it on their network but they still wanted to shop it so when tosh got attached you know and he we decided that he was going to be Malloy. that was uh you know the voice just fit so well and then we started making his personality more and more like tosh <laughs> now how does this new show uh, paradise pd uh, how does this uh, differ from say brickleberry it's got a lot of differences. For one, it's uh, it's got a family element to it because the chief uh, is married. His ex-wife actually is the mayor, and their son is Kevin, who gets hired on the force uh, in the first episode. So you've got that family element. And we also do a season-long arc. We have one story that lasts the whole season. Oh, wow. And, uh, like, the first episode ends with a cliffhanger, and then that's paid off uh, in the last episode of the season. Uh, is is there a chance that we might see any characters cross over from Brickleberry at some point, or any Stern Show homages like in, uh, in Brickleberry? Definitely Stern Show. Uh, you can count on that. <laughs> we, we've got a big Stern Show appearance. Um, hopefully, if we get a season two, we're going to start doing some crossovers. It was something that was talked about, but didn't want to do it this season. There's a lot of paperwork that has happened before anything like that could be possible, so... Huh. We're keeping our fingers crossed that uh, we can get some lawyers involved and hopefully get something going season two on that. We'd love to. We'd love to do more Brickleberry. I mean, we still love the show. But, uh, you know, it's just hard. Once the show gets canceled, uh, everybody just wants what's new. You know, they want a new show. They don't want to touch something that's got any kind of stink on it from cancellation. And we spent years taking Brickleberry to every every person who would talk to us. You know, we got close a lot of times, but um, it's just really hard when, when another network owns a show to get anybody else interested because everybody wants to own their own stuff, you know? Yeah. I, I enjoyed the comics you were doing. I mean, is there any you know possibility of maybe continuing in a comic form? Yeah, we'd like to adapt that into a movie one day. I mean, um, you know, we, we love writing the comic, and uh, we, yeah, we, we just want to keep carrying on Brickleberry if we can. In some in some aspect, but uh, yeah, like like I said, it's a it's a lot of a lot of red tape we'd have to go through. But yeah, I mean anything's possible. Yeah, the comments are great. That was the first time we got to be truly uncensored. You know, there wasn't anything we couldn't do. Uh, we got no notes on the comics. We just wrote it and it got drawn up exactly like we wrote it, and nothing got changed. So that was, I, 
and that's got to be liberating, though, man. Because I mean, uh, you guys, you, you guys got away with a lot, and I fuck. Brickleberry was fucking brilliant, man. Like I was, I feel like it was way ahead of its time, and uh, I, I just, it, it was a trap. I was, I actually, I actually was really upset when it got canceled. But I mean, I, I'm surely they fucked with you. I mean, how was it uh, to the deal with the censors? I mean, I, I mean, you got away with a lot, but I'm sure that. Uh, you know, uh, what, what's the, can you name one instance, like, where you thought you could get something by and they just kept fucking with you, like, uh, to change it? Probably hemorrhoid Jesus, right? Yeah. We, we wanted to crucify uh, a hemorrhoid with Jesus' face on it, and they just, they, they had to put their foot down for once. <laughs> yeah. But they, they definitely uh, were, le- you know, less strict uh, by the time, you know, season three rolled around. They're just like, all right, do it if you want, you know. They just kind of gave up. So Wake on Up would have to pretty much police ourselves. And we're finding we have to do that, too, on uh, Netflix, too. I mean, just because you can get away with something and, you know, animation makes it a little easier to swallow, we don't necessarily want to do it, you know. Yeah, we have to say, do we really want to do this just because we can? <laughs> well, that leads me to my next question. Uh, has either of you ever felt that, like, you may have went too far in any single episode in any particular, uh, you know, joke or sketch? Mm. Maybe a sketch, <laughs> but uh, no, I don't mean I don't think anything that aired on Brickleberry did. I think there were a few ideas that we killed before it ever got to air that that was probably a good idea to to stay dead. But uh, no, I mean it's comedy, you know, and I think it just proves that we really don't get a lot of negative feedback about the show. I mean, I think that that the people who watch it understand is they're just jokes. And it's not coming from a mean, spirited place. It's just to make people laugh, and that's all it is. We just want to make people laugh and forget about whatever they're going through in their lives and give them a break. They don't have to think about their problems. Just come with us and, you know, get a good laugh, and that's all what it's all about. See, we, I, I think we definitely you're... don't. Go ahead. I think you're absolutely right, man, because I do feel like we're getting to a point where comedians can't tell jokes anymore without, like, you know, the, the, you know, I think the world's becoming, like, just humongous pussies, and, like, things have become so politically correct. I think people like you are very, very important, uh, and, and, and I'm mean, just, it's nice, because you just pretty much uh, explained it, like, uh, perfectly, you know? Uh, I, can't rem- I can't remember how many times where, like, you guys shit just made me forget about what I had going on at the time, or just entertained me, or made me just, you know you know, happy uh, that I'm not thinking about, like, my shitty life or things going on in it. So, like, I, I don't think people understand it is uh, escapism and, like, uh, that kind of, uh, that entertainment. So, like, I, I don't know, it just, it, it almost uh, bothers me at this point where, like, you know, comedians get in trouble for telling jokes and, like, everybody's pretty much a pussy nowadays. I mean, what, what do you guys think about that? Uh, you know, it doesn't really affect us. We still do our th- <laughs> the same thing we always have the same way. You know, we, we didn't hold back at all on this uh, show, and Netflix is 100% behind us, you know. I mean, I, I, I see it happening to people, but it, it really hasn't affected us, and we're really happy that it hasn't, you know, because, uh, you know, it's been many years since Brickleberry, but it's still the, the same kind of humor we're doing, you know, just like back then, if not even pushed a little bit harder. But I think it's all about just making it clever and, and coming from a place of, uh, you know, really just, it's just, you know, obviously it's just comedy. It's not mean-spirited. I think, I guess maybe people get in trouble sometime when it gets a little too mean-spirited or whatever. But uh, the one thing we do is that, you know, we just attack all sides. We don't, we don't have a side. We don't have a, a point of view. You know, if we're going to make, we just make fun of everything, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's stuff to make fun of, you know, ridiculous stuff everywhere, you know. And we, we don't get too political we, we like roger said we just kind of stick in the middle and shoot darts at everybody is that what you feel makes your sense of humor unique from everyone else mm-hmm. yeah i think it's definitely that that you don't know what our opinion is exactly you know we just look for the ridiculous everywhere and, and definitely not trying to get preachy or put our agenda on anybody or change anybody's mind like i said the goal is just laughter that's it What's a fun fact about Waco and Roger that your fans may not know about you? Like something just completely off the wall? Well, I, I think we're way more boring than anybody thinks we are. <laughs> yeah. I can't even yeah, picture that. that the crazy, this, guy, this is crazy guys. And we're not. We just seem that way, I guess. But, I mean, we take our jobs very seriously, and we work really hard at it. And, uh, you know.
you know, we hear stories of writers coming in like, hey, you're going to love this writer. You're going to this guy. He comes in and he'll whip his dick out in the room and you'll love it. It's like, why do you think I'd love that? <laughs> I'm not going to love that. I want a writer who's going to work his ass off to make the show better and uh, to make the show funnier. You know, you put in the hard work and then, and then you kick back and have fun later. But uh, You can whip your dick nah, out we, all you want. <laughs> yeah, then, then whip it out. But get the work done first. <laughs> but, uh, no, we're all about just putting our heads down and, and getting the getting the job done, you know? Have you guys encountered any jealousy from, like, friends for, like, landing a Netflix deal? Because that's a pretty big fucking deal, man. I don't know. I mean, we've been doing the same thing for so long. Since, since 98, we've been doing comedy. And it took so long, I think everybody felt so sorry for us. I was just kind of happy that we finally got jobs. <laughs> yeah, there's a... They saw how depressed, you know, they saw how depressed we are for all those years of nothing <laughs> happening. And then, you know, we finally get a show goes one season, gets canceled, and then we realize that we're broke as hell because they didn't pay us anything. And MTV, no. Yeah, MTV2. Are and you then serious? All those they years later. It. MTV2 nah, fucked didn't. you guys over? Hell. Well, I mean, we signed the contract, so we, uh, I don't think they fucked us over. We, we knew what we were getting, but what are you going to turn down the show at MTV? <laughs> No. Yeah, most most of the time you get you screwed over your your first your first time out just because you know you're hungry and you want you want you want to get on television and you'll you'll take anything. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Is there anything guy uh, you guys have worked on that like you feel like you wish you maybe could have like uh, it wasn't complete in your own mind and you wish you could have maybe redid it? No, I think we're pretty good about just knowing the limitations knowing that nothing can be perfect you spend as much time as you've got on something and it is what it is i think people get too caught up in making things perfect and things never get done it's better to be finished than perfect you know so i don't and i don't think we we don't sit and stress over and rewrite and read a lot of showrunners will rewrite they'll keep their staff till like two in the morning doing new jokes and new jokes and new jokes because the, the newer jokes are always going to be more attractive to you than the one you already wrote doesn't mean it's better, you know. It's new. Yeah. We've heard horror stories of, of showrunners keeping their staffs all night working on two or three jokes. You know, we just we just get it out there, and then you know we screen. That's how we determine what works and what doesn't. We do a lot of screenings with the staff, and if something's not getting a laugh, we change it. But if they're laughing, we leave it. Even if we were like that, not our favorite joke or whatever, or something that we really did like. If they're not laughing at it, we kill it. You know, we get it right out of there. But uh, we we don't we don't sit and like you know stress out about oh this this wasn't quite perfect no get it done and get, yeah, let people watch it you know yeah sometimes you just got to be you know be confident in, in your work and you know if it's if it's working once it'll probably work you know you're not really working in a vacuum so much anymore you, there are definitely episodes we like better than others, and a lot of that has to do with like how much of a pain in the ass it was to get that episode done, not necessarily the final product, you know? Well, that actually leads me into my next question. Like, from the very beginning, from start to finish, like, how long does it take to complete an episode? Well, we do all ten at once, so it'd be tough to say how long does it take to do one episode. To get all ten done from start to finish is a, a little less than a year. Oh, wow. But we're working in all, all different stages at the same time. Like we'll be writing a script, working on an outline, looking at character designs, color, storyboards, animatics, like all at the same time. We're getting pulled in like so many different directions. It just has a lot of spinning plates. Yeah. Yep. Now, where do you think up these premises, man? Because like you guys are always really strong at that, and they're always really funny. I mean, is this shit that you you, you just comes to you and like you wake up at night, you write it down, or like I mean, do you do you sit down and you brainstorm with people? How does how do you come up with that shit? It can come from any one of those places, you know. You just never know. Like we were in the post office one time and we thought of an episode idea. Oh yeah, can you remember? That, that, can you remember which one is it? Is it for Brickleberry or the new show? It was for Brickleberry. It was the one where the. Uh, they had the they outsourced the rangers and then the <laughs> yeah, robot from that. India came in. <laughs> yeah, that's a and Roger and I were in line at the post office. I can't remember exactly what sparked it, but that that whole idea came out right there. And like a uh, gay bomb came out because that was actually a real thing that I read the military was working on. I remember reading something you know? like that. Yeah, that's another yeah. great one. Connie yeah, is a great and, character. Like, <laughs> and some of them just come out from just sitting in the writer's room for hours and hours and just spitballing. Yeah, like they one writer up will say, you know, what if what if what if Denzel, you know, uh, met a caveman? Or like, no, 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 he should meet a cave woman and try to fuck her because he's in a 
really old women, and you can't get older than a cave woman, so. Yeah. It's a lot of... Like a world record. Yeah. And a lot of stuff is like, you know, the old saying, you know, write what you know, and, uh, you know, especially with Paradise this season, like, we, uh, we kind of took stories from our childhood and, you know, characters, you know, that we, we encountered growing up, like, in the Deep South, like, rednecks and stuff, but, um, there's one episode we did, uh, about Dungeons and Dragons where, um, the, the town church is against Dungeons and Dragons because they, they think it's devil worship, and Waco and I both experienced that when we were in high school, so. Oh, wow, you see, I was in the same way, man, I, uh, my believe it or not, my uh, my my stepdad was like a like a like I guess a, like a assistant pastor, and my mom was a Sunday school teacher, and I was I was heavily into punk rock, and I'm st- I still am in the horror movie. I'm I'm a horror fanatic. I was a horror movie fan since I was a kid, and you know they'd always say like, oh, it's gonna come through the TV, and you're gonna get possessed, and all that bullshit. And, uh, yeah, so like yeah, I mean I was like I could relate to that, man. It's like I was always kind of yeah. chastised and looked down upon as uh, as Satan growing up myself. So I mean. Uh, it's interesting. Where did you Where did you grow up? I I actually grew up, um, yeah. Well, hence Elwood City. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. I, I I grew up. I I was in, I grew up in Freedom for a little bit, and then as I got older, I my mom met him, and they got married. We moved to Elwood, and I was there ever since. I uh, and uh, you know, that's uh, I've been there a good majority of my life. So, and uh, it's kind of like it's like you guys are saying. I mean, probably not to the degree that you guys are used to growing up, but it was a very. Uh, you know, a uh, redneck uh, kind of area, and like, uh, yeah, I, I grew, <laughs> I, I grew up like like and uh, all that stuff, and like they weren't ready for it, man. Like I went to school with like uh, farm boys and tractors and pitchforks and shit, and you come in there and like you're, uh, yeah, they're not uh, looking for anybody different. So they were burning crosses in my yard and you know calling me oh, the, calling me the n word, and like I'm like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> I'm like. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it was a, I had so, yeah, and I used to piss on my gym clothes, and then uh, all the teachers hated me too, so they'd make me fucking wear them and shit. So like, but that's a whole oh, other shit. fucking show, man. I uh, sounds like you got a show on you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I was always uh, you know, uh, but but I, hey, but I showed them. I grew up, and I am now one of the shittiest callers on the Howard Stern shows. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you how did you find out about the damn show? Did you hear Roger plug it on Stern? Oh yeah, man! That and like my buddy had MTV too, and I seen a, a fucking a trailer for it. So, so oh yeah, I, so I yeah, used to go. I used to go over, out so I, much I, by I just letting y'all go, there, go uh, you know, plug it. Yeah, I'd make a point to go over there when it was on because I didn't have it. So uh, yeah, but uh, I like I said, dude, I've always been a fan of you guys growing up. I've always been a big. Uh, here's a funny story. I when I was younger, I. Uh, I wanted. Uh, I love Yucko. Like I always wanted. I well, you used to you used to offer this thing where you would do uh, like a telephone greeting or something. And then oh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Then I, I finally saved up enough money to do it, and then you stopped doing it. And I was like, yeah, you saved five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I like your insultomatic though, dude. I got it on my phone. Uh, I, I, I fucking, I fuck around. With, I like to fucking play it for people all the time. Hmm. Nice. <laughs> but uh, moving right along, can I ask you some shit that's not related to Paradise PD that actually airs this uh, on the thirty first on? Ca- and, uh, but, uh, we, we'll get back to that. I want but I, I just wanted to know, everybody has a good, like, shit your pants story. Like, uh, have you, do you guys have a good one? I've got one. It's not about me, though. Oh, that's fine. I got one about my buddy, uh, oh. his name is John Radcliffe. I was just a hand, oh, the hand, like, he's basically a human cockroach, you know, <laughs> I went to college with him and he, he saved my ass many times. So I, I owe him a lot of favors, but you know, he does stuff. He like, he eats raw hamburger meat. You know, oh, he'll know like micro- he'll microwave a steak. You know, he eats spaghetti off of a cardboard box. Oh, geez. You know, he just he just you know he can live in any condition. He'll sleep outside. You know, he doesn't care. But anyway, where was it, Roger? Was it was it Alabama? Alabama? Oh, you know, I, I, I don't even know what city it was in. But I didn't go. But uh, a bunch of my fraternity brothers went to go see a UGA play somewhere, and of course they all get completely drunk and uh two of my buddies <laughs> they come and they're just stumbling back to the hotel and they see a laundry hamper and they're they're <laughs> arguing about who gets to jump in it and take a ride and uh so they do like paper rock scissors or whatever so one of them jumps in it uh and the other one's pushing them and you know, having a good time and then when he comes to get out he realizes he's just completely covered in shit like <laughs> everywhere and then so they come in and the guys like puking and everything and like oh my god and then Rackless in there and he's just 
cracking up because he was the one who shit at it. <laughs> he came back. He came back. He was drunk, and for some reason, he decided to get like a. He found a mop or something, propped himself up, and just shit all in this laundry hamper. I can't tell you why. It's because he's an idiot. Just seemed like a thing to do at like the time, that. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's the fact that they had to argue over uh, who got to get in that pile of Radcliffe shit. Which is funny. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know Roger's got a mini yucko, like that story about, you got, you got a good vomit story, I know that. Oh, hey, bring it oh. on, man. I'm looking for anything like that I'm looking for, for sure. Oh, oh gosh. Uh, but, you see, this was at, in Atlantic City, like, 2002. It's the, the Stuttering John uh, Crazy Cabby fight. And uh, uh, I, this is, like, one of my first, like, stern events, like, on, on location, you know, um, with the Trump Taj Mahal. Um, and there was an after party after the fight. Um, and everyone, you know, all the... I was meeting all the fans for the first time, and they kept buying me shots of Jack, and I was just like knocking back all these shots. And so I was in this VIP sec, going to this VIP section. And they're like, you know, there's all the, you know, the typical, you know, uh, strippers and stuff like that, and 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 hot girls hanging out and stuff. And um, I get really sick from all this fucking Jack. So I don't want. It was such a pain in the ass to get through the velvet ropes into the VIP section. I didn't want to go, leave. So I opened up my suit and stuck my head inside it. I got this big, you know, the big clown, baggy clown suit. I stuck my head inside it and just puked my guts out and just leaned back. And then I was still getting like lap dances and stuff like that. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you were squishing all in there. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> Not my proudest moment, but um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to wear that yucko suit with all that vomit in it. Oh, yeah. I never, never washed it. I was just going to ask you, have you ever washed it even after that? It smells so bad. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't even smell like vomit. I can't even describe exactly what it smells like. But see, that's part of the Yucko interviews. Is first, they get they get caught off guard by the smell. <laughs> when he goes, hey, I'm Yucko the Clown, you know, and you can just see that, that stench hit him. They're just kind of, they're already shocked from that. And then Roger starts hitting him with the insult. <laughs> has, like anybody, a has, has anybody ever, like, tried to, like, physically, like, beat the shit out of you? Um, not really beat the shit out of me, but it definitely uh, got offended, and uh, you know I've got my my nose grabbed a few times, but you know nothing nothing too too crazy. I mean that's one uh, good part about being a clown is like you're not supposed to fucking take it too seriously. So have you ever gotten pussy from it? Like, has any you know, like pick up a drunk chick or like has anybody got turned on from it? <laughs> I, I haven't met one one that can take the smell. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here, here, here's another equally fucked up question, guys. Uh, have you ever injured yourself sexually? I, I'm still a virgin, so. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I definitely haven't jerked off so I'm, many times I ripped my pee hole when I was a kid. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very careful. You you had an injury. It wasn't sexual. Yeah, it wasn't sexual, though. Yeah, I, I was, you know, playing soccer, and uh, I landed on a guy's cleat that fell in front of me. And I tore my epididymis. Uh, I didn't even know I had an epididymis, but yeah, it, it, it was it, it hurt. Holy shit! I was born without a ring around my cock, and I had to have the doctor carve it in like a pumpkin. So that was uh, that's equally as, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was fucked up, man. And it, and it was even more fucked that. up as my mom was watching at the time. So. And how old were you when he carved the the ring around your dick? Probably about like I would guess like eight years old. I'd imagine. Uh-huh. Man, I, I, that's the first I've never heard that. It's fucked up, yeah, man. Like it all grew together. So like when I'd get a fucking boner, like it would all rip like the Hulk shirt, and then and, uh, <laughs> and it was fucking painful, man. And, like finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to fucking show my mom my oh cock, my God. and then she was like, Jesus Christ. So then she took me to the doctor, and then he's like, uh, he's like, oh yeah, we could fix that. And he pulls out a scalpel and he. Carves a fucking, uh, you know, I guess like a fucking moat into like around the the, the rim of my oh, cock. So, and then uh, it, it still never fucking healed the same. You know, I still got this weird like, you know, sensitive area where it never cool fully heals. So like anytime I have sex or I jerk my dick off, like you know, it's always really sensitive. So, but I'm sure you guys wanted to hear that while plugging your show, right? <laughs> yeah, I was just about to go to uh, Pitfire Pizza, but now I'm <laughs> hungry. <laughs> 
Or I can tell you the story when I ripped my pee hole uh, after jerking off 14 times when I was a kid. Uh-huh. And then it felt like oh, you were pissing broken glass for a month afterwards till it healed. That was fun, too. But anyway. Uh, Jesus Christ. Oh, here's another question for you. Uh, speaking of beating off, uh, who did you beat off most to as a young adult? Oh, my God. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. I, uh, I can't remember. Like, uh, Linda Carter, maybe? I, I don't know. I, I Hey, I'll, no, no, no. If, I'll tell you mine if it'll make you feel better. It's super fucking embarrassing. I, you remember the fucking video for Cold Hearted Snake with Paul Abdul? I used to jerk my dick oh. off to that all the time. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say to the cat, the cartoon cat she was in the video with. Oh, yeah, the, 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 that was later on. Yeah, he was pretty oh, hot. Yeah. Fucking MC Scat what, Cat. What Holy shit. <laughs> you have a busted a nut till you jerked your dick off to MC Scat Cat. <laughs> Oh, you know his name. I, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm definitely not in the witness relocation program. Cat, cat. <laughs> yeah, he's in the fucking shit on his face and stuff, I think. Oh, <laughs> uh, what was that? Who talked to him to do that video? <laughs> That's a bad idea. Oh, uh, what's the weirdest thing a fan's ever asked you guys to do? And hopefully it's not my shitty show. <laughs> Gotcha, fucker. Oh, I'm sure. Yucko's on many, many body parts, right? Oh, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. Have you ever and, signed uh, a dude's balls before? No, but that, that was uh, a couple creepy dudes, like, you know, want, want you to, to to sign it so they can get their, their get a tattoo over your signature. Oh. And yeah, I, got, I think I did, some, some dude was like right on his neck, like right on his juggler. I was like, oh, man. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, it's really weird to see people getting tattoos of your characters. Like, there's a ton of Yucko tattoos out there. There are, you know, a few live-action and cartoon Bobby Possum Cods floating around. It's really strange, because that's, that's forever. That's probably, that's like the ultimate, like, fucking, uh, you know, uh, a flattery, though, don't you think? Like, holy shit, man. It is, it, it, when they're good tattoos, when they're, there's some really terrible... <laughs> Like, yeah, like the kind man, you get at like the that. county fair. <laughs> yeah, they don't even look right. They're all mushy and shit. Well, it looks like a fucking like a raisin, like with like uh, rocks in it, and like it's all the you know, and, like oh yeah, that's fucking uh, Yako. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, well, let me ask you this, guys: Do you feel your career has ever had like negative effects on your relationships with like your family, or friends, or uh, loved ones? Oh hell yeah! And how so? I mean, my mom, my mom is going without speaking to me, and you know. Especially back in the Stanker Vision days when I used to dress up like Jesus. That's what she hates the most. And I, I did that a lot. And then I would have to start editing, uh, you know, Brickleberry and sending her DVDs, you know, cutting out a lot of shit. That'd be like three minute episodes. <laughs> I had to cut out a good 18 minutes of content. And then, you know, definitely with my wife too. Uh, uh, Roger and I have done a few sketches that uh, she's like, I don't even want to look at you too. Oh shit! Like, what? Can you can you tell us about one? Well, we were, you know, it looked like we were having sex, you know, a couple times. Did, you know. I mean, like Roger with chicks or each, well, chicks or each other? Ah, uh, each other. Oh, yeah. well, well, what the hell is there to be mad? That's not cheating. <laughs> I don't know. I know it's for comedy. I mean, I mean we're we both good looking dudes. Real. I'd fucking, I'd bang either one of you. What the fuck? <laughs> it looked, it looked pretty real. <laughs> <laughs> was it because it was real? <laughs> No, it wasn't, but it looked real. <laughs> I, I need to see this, I think. <laughs> I bet you have seen it. <laughs> oh, if you're a damn show fan, you probably have some Bobby and Regina. Oh, shit. Is, is that what, is that what, that's the one in question. I think I know, yeah, I think I don't know, I know what you're talking about. I don't know if this was out about. there or not, but yeah, we were, in the, we were in a truck, like, going at it, and it, we decided, we were like, <laughs> hey, we gotta make it look like it's really happening. Let me see here, um... Who's somebody that you admire that you've never gotten to work with yet? I mean, is there any guest stars that would you guys be opposed to putting like guest stars in? Uh, you know, Paris oh, we'd TV? love to. I, I would love to work with Mel Brooks. I mean, we we reached out to him for uh, Brickleberry, and he just said, "Oh, hell no." Seriously, but, uh, I don't just think like you would get it, man. Like I always thought he well, was a he, cool motherfucker. He gets paid. He does movies. You know, when you do movies, you get paid a lot of money for voice acting. I think it's television. more or less like a monetary you know, thing. Yeah, that's what he said. He's like, look, 
I'm not leaving the house for more, you know, for less than this amount. <laughs> well, shit, at least he's honest, man. That's cool. At least he was yeah. like, oh, you guys suck, and I don't want to be part of it. At least he was just like, I want, no, some, I'm sure he'd never I want some fucking money. I want some fucking money. on his radar. <laughs> I don't think he knew anything about us. But, uh, you know, it was worth a shot. But, you know, we did get Mark Hamill to come in. Oh, so my that, God, that that's fucking Roger amazing, man. That's awesome. Very happy. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, yeah. I got to say, man, it is a thrill, because, like, just me being the fucking... Uh, shitty podcast host like having you dudes is like the pinnacle of fucking like uh, I'm super fucking stoked so I can only imagine what you guys feel like when you have like a motherfucker like Mark Hamill coming in how does that work it was awesome and he was really good too he, he yeah. really elevated the episode what would you guys be doing if you weren't doing this oh man that's a good question I have no idea that's why it's so scary every time we get cancelled we don't know what to do I don't think we can do anything up to this point. Who's some of your favorite actors that you would like to have, like, uh, come on the show? Ah, I mean, we we got a couple of them on the show already. You know, Tom Kenny's one of our favorite guys in the Oh, yeah. He's this super talented, nicest guy ever. You know, makes every line funnier. Of course, we love Dave Herman, and uh, we got Kyle Kinane. We're so lucky to have him. He he fits Bullet so well in uh, in Paradise. Um, he didn't even audition. We just we auditioned a bunch of people, and nothing was really working. And then uh, our writer's assistant brought him up, and we remembered him because he was the voice of Comedy Central. And then we watched his stand up, like, oh man, this guy's perfect. And then we found out, you know, he'd done some acting, so. He can actually act too on top of it, so it's like great. So we we finally got him to come in, just one short audition, and you know we offered him the part, and he took it. It always seems like the the small talking animal is the hardest one to cast. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, why. yeah well, you, uh, your first in, instinct is like, okay, he's small, he's furry. Uh, we'll try a cute voice. At least we did, in the in the case of Malloy, we, we tried that with hell. No, no, we learned. That um, you know, just the 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 more adult voice coming out of him, you know, fits the fits the characters better. What the what what, what kind of you know what kind of music? I mean, like uh, who does the score for uh, Paradise PD? Is that all you guys, or do you have somebody that comes in and does the music? Because I know music can be a big a big part of it. <laughs> yeah, we got some really talented guys that worked on Brickleberry, worked on all three seasons of Brickleberry, and we got those same guys back. And they're they're incredible. They can they can do any kind of music. I mean, we've had people you know requesting like soundtrack from Brickleberry or say, "What is this song from this episode?" Because they just do such great work. And uh, yeah, hopefully we get to keep working with them because anything you throw at them, they can do and they can knock it out of the park. What are some uh, you know? What are some bands that you guys grew up on, like that molded and influences like your taste in music? Like, what do you? How'd your taste change from then till now? Like, what do you like? You still listen to the same shit when you were growing up as to now? I like uh, just about everything but country. Like, uh, like, well, I take that back. I like some some old old country. I like like Johnny Cash and you know, uh, uh, yeah, most of the old stuff. Yeah, I don't like that new country ain't the, ain't the best. <laughs> yeah. It ain't the best. No. I mean, I'm the same way. I, I dig about everything. I mean, I was really into, like, NWA and crazy shit, you know, just being the rebel from the Christian family and listening to the dirtiest shit I could possibly get my hands on. I, I definitely enjoyed that. What was the what was the what was the worst album like you've ever bought like like that would piss your parents off like because I know when I was a kid I used to buy like two live crew and shit like that the worst thing you yeah. could possibly oh, get to like try to fucking upset your parents or like you know Ice T yeah. and uh, all that shit. I didn't try to no I didn't want her to find I didn't want her I didn't want her to upset <laughs> I was trying to hide it I, I never wanted to, to piss her off too much because I'm the youngest I had two older brothers that that put her through hell getting arrested many times and all that so I was trying to I was trying to be the good kid so uh, I would definitely do it all I would just I was good at not getting caught what's the best thing you've pulled off that you haven't been caught for when you was a kid oh man I don't know if I can say because I might get caught now (laughs) Well, I think there's probably a statute of limitations. When I was younger, me and my buddy stole the Elby's Big Boy, and I haven't got caught yet. So. <laughs> oh, nice. There, there's a big boy here in Burbank, and uh, I would like to see anybody steal that one. That's a big statue, man. 
<laughs> yeah, it took yeah, like seven yeah, of us to actually get it. That's crazy. Do you have a blowtorch or what? Yeah, yeah, it's sitting out in the woods somewhere still. <laughs> it was, it was, we did it when we were in high school, man. My buddy had a fucking pickup truck. They had a fucking bevy of tools. He had fucking... I remember we sledgehammered the fuck out of the bolts to get it out of the ground. And what was funny is, is like, after we did it, like, we they put a tarp on it, and we parked across the street, and we went in to eat. <laughs> that was the best part about it. It's still sitting out in the woods. Yeah. I bet you I could find it if I had to. But, I mean, I had nothing to do with that. It was the other six gentlemen. But, I mean, uh... But, yeah, it was... There... I don't think kids do stuff like that as much, because they're not as bored as we used to be. Yeah, I mean, well, that's, that's a good point, man. To, do you think technology you now shit. is like a... Do you think technology now is like a... A benefit or like uh, you know maybe a detriment uh, to the kids now. What do you think? I think it's probably some of both. You know, I think that that you know it's obviously great in so many ways, but uh, I don't know. I, I think that we're you know too overprotective. It's so hard not to be with your kids, but uh, but I know I am. You know, I, I used to just go off, and they didn't. My parents didn't know where the hell I was. And I was young. I just go on my bicycle. It was and a I just different time, I man. It. Like you used to be able to leave your doors unlocked and shit. Me and my buddy used to go at the fucking nighttime, and uh, we'd be back at midnight. And now, man, like my old lady listens to this sword and scale shit, and it's like every creepo that's uh, and killer, like in the valley. Every uh, in fact, it's a part of my show. There's a thing she does called Depravity Corner. It's like every fucked up news event that happens at the week. So I'm like. Uh, yeah, it's it's crazy now, man. Like you, you gotta fucking watch everybody. Like, uh, it's, I mean, do you feel like, do you feel that's true? Like, I almost feel like fucking society's changed. It's like a downward spiral. People are kind of fucked up way more than back then. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we just know about them more because you know they were creepy people back then too. There were all kinds of shit going on. I don't know if it's just out there now more, but uh, I know I loved that freedom I had when I was a kid, though. And yeah, I, know my I don't kids even don't think have kids any. go out and play anymore, do they? Like, they're always fucking plugged in. No. Man. It's like fucking... No, not, 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 not unless you make them. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I mean, pretty much every kid's like that, you know. Definitely try to limit it as much as we can, but that's that's all they want to do. But back, uh, back to the show now. Like, uh, that'll be on Netflix, and that'll be premiering August 31st, correct? Uh, do, you, what, do you know what time yet? Yeah, uh, it's just uh, it'll be on at like midnight or three a.m. And then, it'll, then you know, you'll have access. When you to wake the up whole Friday, season. it'll be on. I'm gonna be uh, fucking binge watching the shit out of that, man. I tell you that. Please do. And yeah, I will be, please I'm, I'm do. Gonna, hey, are you, is there any plans of calling in to tell Howard about it? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like 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 I said, like um, you know, Howard has helped us out so much as as far as getting the getting our our content out there, and uh, you know, yeah, definitely, definitely. Want to be calling in? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, if you guys don't mind, even after you call in, I, I, I even would like to, uh, you know, put my two cents in too when I call. If that's cool, I mean, uh, please do. <laughs> I would. Uh, yeah. I, I just, uh, I want. I love to see you guys, uh, you know, uh, be successful with this because uh, I can tell already. I've been watching all the fucking trailers and all the shit, and, and uh, it's making me fucking piss my pants already. So, I oh, can't, nice. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you're gonna like it. I can't wait, man. I'm fucking super excited. I mean, uh, anything... And bef- before we close, do you guys have any words of wisdom for my listeners on what it's like to be, uh, you know, working on a show? I mean, do you... How, what kind of what kind of a person does it take? Like, I'm sure it's, like, hardworking and diligent. I mean, well, I mean, what's, uh, you know... Do you, what do you get out of it? Do you get, uh, you know... What does it make? I mean, is it is it is the pros uh, better than the cons? Oh, definitely. You know, I mean, it, it's not key to happiness <laughs> I don't know what is but uh you can always find something to be miserable about but uh it's nice you know you kind of have to just sit back and realize how lucky you are you know when you start you know complaining about shit or are getting stressed out about deadlines or, or whatever but uh we're, we're very lucky to have three shows now uh on television so you know it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of a lot of luck happen well i just want to thank you guys again for being my guest and uh, i mean like i said man this is a dream come true i i love you cats and i really really uh i really hope uh everybody loves this show as much as i know i'm gonna so uh thank you for stopping by i appreciate you guys taking the time and uh yeah like i said i'm gonna continue to plug this shit and uh you know uh it was a pleasure talking to you cats i love you guys yeah thank you so much for having us 
No problem, man. Peace and love. Peace and love. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to be a cop on the Paradise PD. Let me show you I can do this. No one wants to be a cop anymore. Hello? Don't you yell at me, you son of a bitch. Any of you idiots managed to do any police work yesterday? I pulled over a suspicious looking colored fella. You put a dog in charge of drug evidence? Drugs, drugs, look out, drug train coming through. <laughs> And she's back, cats. You haven't heard from her in a long time. You know her. You love her. Are you cats ready for the depravity corner? It hasn't been here for a while, so I hope you're going to get your fix of depravity this time. X Tina, give them what they want. All right, folks. Well, we are going to take a little trip to Australia. Good day, mate. Good day, mate. We're going down under. There we go. So we are going to go back to 2007. Well, actually, it's probably more like 2006, I'm going to say. Uh, back in the day before Facebook and Twitter and all that craziness, Instagram, uh, we had a little place called MySpace, which was, I think it was pretty darn cool. You could change your background. You could have music playing on it. I loved MySpace, man. I was a MySpace junkie. So, apparently, so was Carly Ryan. A fifth, well, a 14-year-old girl from Australia. And she was into emo and listened to, you know, different bands. She would go with her friends to, you know, emo clubs and follow different bands around and, you know, into the, row into the, like, emo scene. I mean, I'd have probably been her friend when I was that age, but anyway, she, um, liked that kind of thing, and she met some dude on MySpace named Brandon, who loved, um, like, he was in a band, and he was into the same sort of music, and so this one hit me close to home, because this is sort of why, how Balls and I met, we met online, and we found out we were into the same old kind of music, and it was like, blowing each other's minds with, I can't believe you know that band, what do you mean you know that band, what, oh my god, you know, so, and, um, so, you know, I was totally, like, digging this thing, and vibing with this chick, and I could totally feel that, so, she um, forms this relationship with this dude. Now, he lives four hours away from her, so it wasn't like they could actually meet, like, real quick and, you know, being 15 and all. So, plus he also, he had, like, a dual citizenship. I guess he was American, but he lived in Australia because, I guess, his parents were divorced and one of them was originally from there, so they must have moved back. So he lived, um, like, a dual citizenship and he... Uh, did whatever, so, you know, anytime there was any chance of, like, trying to get together, you know, it just wasn't really feasible. Uh, along comes an opportunity, her 15th birthday party that her mom's thrown her, and she wants her boyfriend to come. And at this point, they considered each other boyfriend and girlfriend, um, sort of cute, you know, whatever, online little fling thing, whatever. And so, uh, the mom's like, well, I don't know, I mean, I guess he could come, but... Uh, I have to meet him first before he comes to our house. So I thought that was pretty cool that the mom was willing to do that. So all of a sudden, come like a day or two before the birthday, the, he has to go to America because his mom needed him over there for something important or so I don't know, whatever. So he's like, but oddly enough, my dad's going to be in like near your town for business. So he can bring your gift if you don't mind. And... So they said, well, okay, that'll be all right, but my mom's got to meet him. So, like, the day before this birthday party, the mom goes to, like, a shopping center, meets this guy's dad. He seems like a totally normal dad-type guy. So everything seemed to be kosher, so she's like, okay, sure, you can come to my daughter's birthday party. So she's kind of, like, nervous yet excited to meet her boyfriend's dad, because even though she hasn't met him, like, this is kind of neat. So... Her friends are there, she's there, they're opening presents, and he gives her the present from his son, and it's a nurse's slutty outfit. Uh, 
Okay, red flags. What's up with that? Um, you're buying your girlfriend a nurse's slutty outfit that you're not going to even see, let alone have a chance to see her in. Maybe she could take pictures of herself in it. Okay, maybe I'll give you that. But And then you're going to give it to your dad to give to her, and I don't know if she opened it in front of everybody. Hopefully she didn't. But at any rate, then all of a sudden, dad... He's um, eyeing up her like teeny bopper friends and getting like a little too um, too touchy feely. Like he asked one of her friends, I think, to sit on his lap or something at the party, and it was just a little like not super creepy, but like enough to like kind of raise your eyebrows. Like, wait a minute here, what's going on? So anyway, it was getting late, and I don't know where this guy was staying. I supposedly, he was staying at this hotel, and then the I you know they all got along all right so the mom let him stay at their house uh yeah that's kind of not really a good idea no matter how much you even know somebody that's not a good idea so we let this guy's dad stay at the night guess where he woke up in the morning yeah in the 15 year old girl's bed um attempting to unbutton her pants yeah so are we gonna tell our boyfriend that your dad's a sicko perv and trying to get with me um yeah i don't she kind of hesitates and doesn't want to tell him that she surely doesn't tell her mom until the guy's like gone and then um so i think he tried to like invite himself over again the next day and this carly was like no i really think he shouldn't come over again and then she finally i think told her mom what happened so her mom was like, oh my god, he's never allowed over here. I don't even want you, like, seeing this boy anymore or talking to him, whatever. And she's like, well, he didn't do it. You know, it's his dad. And so she ultimately told the boyfriend uh, what happened. And he supposedly, you know, bitched out his dad for it and so on and so forth. Well, Carly was a very good girl. I mean, she didn't, you know, she did stuff, but she always told her mom. Like, they had a pretty close relationship. Like, mom knew where she was at all times. Never, you know, to sneak out and be drinking and partying or nothing like that. So, one night, a couple weeks later, um, they wake up and she's gone. No sign of her, no text, no note, no nothing. So, of course, mom's freaking out. Calls all our friends. Nobody's heard from her. Nobody knows where she is. Or she told him, maybe she told her mom she was going to, like, a club that night or something. Maybe that's the story. I can't remember. But anyway, they, you know, none of the friends had heard from her or had seen her. Um, so here it turns out that this boyfriend of hers, Brandon, magically appeared in this town that he couldn't be in, and you know, two weeks prior. But he's there now, and he's, you know, kind of encouraging her to meet him in the middle of the night secretly because, you know, doesn't want her mom to know because now he thinks their dad, his dad's a perv. And so she does because she's been dying to meet this kid for well over a year. She's formed a relationship with him online. I mean, I, I, I get it. Um, but still, you know, always tell someone where you're going. Always, always, always. So she goes and she meets up with him and there is a, um, a teenager dude and um, he doesn't really look like the guy she was talking to online but she's like alright I guess I don't know nobody really knows what, what happened there and the dad's there as well he never went back home to wherever he was coming from so uh, while they file a missing persons report I mean they, people had given an account of seeing her with a young dude and uh, an older man near this river and um, a few weeks later or maybe not a few weeks I don't know how long it was like maybe uh, a week 10 days who knows um, after her mom never heard from her no friends heard from her they can't you know nobody can locate this girl unfortunately her body washed up uh, on the shore and um, Lo and behold, here it is. It's her, and it looks like she was strangled and and uh, drowned to death. And I I I don't know if she was raped. I mean, you think that would be the obvious thing, but uh, I actually don't recall that. But um, anyway, uh, at any rate, uh, turns out they confiscate or you know do the the track back to find this guy's dad because they're assuming that that's who did it. And so they, they look into this kid, Brandon's MySpace, and find it uh, an IP address, and it's attached to this 50-year-old dude named Gary something. 
and here it turns out when they go to bust Gary uh, Gary is talking to now another 14 year old girl online Gary was in fact Brandon he made it all up he was a freaking catfish he there was no young boy the reason he actually and this is even more fucked up the reason he had a young boy with him that sort of could be considered that was like a teenager was his like a strange son who he hadn't seen in like 10 years um, who I don't I thought I could have sworn they said he got out of jail or something and um, they were trying to like get back their father son relationship and so they were hanging out well he made him like pose as this teenage dude and go and, and kill this chick I mean and nobody knows I don't think like if maybe she just wasn't cooperating and the killing just sort of came in like after I don't know that it was necessarily super premeditated murder because maybe she just didn't cooperate with what they wanted and then they just sort of it just sort of happened you know but regardless um thank god they got the guy the mom became really big into um like they got a foundation going uh, to protect young girls against online predators and um, you know you can donate I think it's uh, if you look up Carly Ryan Australia you'll find uh, all the information there but uh, it's very interesting she seemed like a cool chick it's very very tragic and uh, I don't know man you just got to be so so careful these days online um, you know balls and I met and you know instantly I was like oh my gosh, he's amazing, and like, but is he really going to be this way in real life, and luckily I got what I, what I bargained for, so, and that's so rare these days, so, what are your thoughts on? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, because uh, I kind of felt the same way, because uh, when I had met you, uh, you were everything I was looking for, and I'm like, this is truly too good to be true, because I wish I had time to tell you the story now, I'm sure uh, I will, in further a future show, I'll you know, I'll tell you the story in depth, but I, in fact, uh, did get catfished quite a few times. In fact, one time, very, very good. So, I mean, it's not a thing people seem to think like, oh, I would never fall for that. You'd have to be dumb to fall for that. In this age and day, I got to tell you, they're very good, and, uh, you know, they have people that could uh, very easily fool even the smartest of people. I mean, uh, they they stick it out for months, years, I mean, uh, before. So, I mean, it's very easy to fall you know, uh, under that spell. I mean, uh, let this just be a, like a, a cautionary tale. I mean, it's a very tragic thing. I mean, but at least something good came out of it. I mean, uh, her mom has had, had, had this foundation, and uh, people can be more aware. I mean, it's a devastating thing, and it's a horrible thing that happened, but I mean, uh, I mean, at the very least, at least one little good thing came out of such a horrible tragedy. So, but that being said, uh, you know, would you have anything in close here, X Tina? Not really, just, uh, you know, watch out, tell somebody where you're going, especially if you're meeting somebody online, even if you're a dude, because, you know, there's some psycho chicks out there too, guys, just so you know. Oh, don't I know it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, guys, uh, that, that will conclude this week for the Balls from Melwood Show. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I, uh, it was a very action-packed show today. But uh, next week, I have a very special guest coming up as well that you are not going to want to miss. I am going to be talking to uh, punk rock legend and uh, an author, uh, Frank Portman, Dr. Frank from the Mr. T Experience. Uh, it's a punk band at XT and I, GMT, grown up, and we still dig to this date. So don't miss it, cats. Tune in next week. Until then, peace and love. Peace and love. It's funny how, like, people are on Facebook like Benji and Go right on. Facebook uh, Live. But one day we're going to invent that. Periscope, everybody. Uh, 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 high pitch airing of the show. High pitch airing. You can see him in living color. <laughs> Funny side note, yes. Oh,